Damnation comes through the body and salvation comes through the body. And your spirit is in many ways following your body. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. One Mardi Gras night in 1520s Paris, college students Jean Calvin, founder of Calvinism and autocratic ruler of Geneva, Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Counter-Reformation Catholic Religious Order, the Jesuits, and their body friend, Francois Rabelais, the humanist novelist, find themselves mixed up in a gruesome murder, and any one of them might be guilty. The ensuing investigation sparks a battle of wits and weapons, plunging them into questions of justice and mercy, grace and sin, innocence, guilt, love, and contempt. Before the bells ring in the start of Lent, they must confront the darkest parts of their souls and find the courage to pursue truth in a world that seems intent on obscuring it. Sonne la Matina, Jane Clark Charles' verse play, released in 2023, imagines what might have happened if these three brilliant, volatile men had to put their convictions to the test while navigating a brutal crime and their own involvement in it. In this episode, Noah Gould, Acton's alumni and student programs manager, talks with Charles about her play and the themes that it explores, including questions of justice, grace, sin, and the importance of the body. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Jane Clark Charles is an American poet, playwright, and critic. Her poetry has appeared in many American and European outlets, including the BBC, the Hopkins Review, the New Ohio Review, the American Journal of Poetry, The Lamp, Measure Review, and others. Her criticism has appeared in Dappled Things, Fair Forward, Plow Quarterly, as well as others. Her first verse drama, Sonale Matina, was published by Wiseblood Books in February 2023. The play had its theatrical debut in New York City on February 21, 2023 at the New Box Theater. She lives in Detroit with her husband and children. We're really thrilled to have you on today, Jane. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. I think our last conversation was uh, in our other podcast, Act and Unwind, on your fantastic article on Cormac McCarthy. So I really enjoyed that conversation uh, and happy to have you uh, on our main stage production of uh, Act in Line today. So uh, we'll put that uh, essay in the, in the show notes for everyone as well. But I want to dive into your uh, new play or um, new for our audience uh, Sonele Matina, and this is a really interesting kind of ex- exploration of a lot of themes through three characters. Um, so tell us a little bit about just kind of the germ of the idea for this play. What was the first kind of idea that got you started? Sure. Um, so I was in Paris with my husband in 2017. We did kind of a late honeymoon to France, and um, we were walking around, and I just read in a tour book that John Calvin and St. Ignatius of Loyola studied at the same college and they studied under Erasmus. And I just thought that was so interesting um, to have those great minds all in one place. And uh, they likely overlapped by a little bit. So one place, one time. And then I I love Rabelais. I've always loved Rabelais for years and years. And so then um, I started looking into it and Rabelais is a little hard to track throughout history. It's hard to mm-hmm. really know where he is specifically, especially in his early life, but it seems likely that he was in and around Paris at this time. So um, I just thought, oh my gosh, it'd be so fun to put all these characters in in conversation with each other. So I batted around a lot of different, different forms for the idea. I thought about writing a novel. I'm not really strong in writing fiction though. And 
that I love writing dramatic monologues, um, verse dramatic monologues. That's my favorite form to write. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll write like a series of dramatic monologues. And then my husband, he was making fun of me. He's like, you know what that's called? That That's called a play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we already oh. have that. That that exists already. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to admit this. So I just decided let's try it as a play. And um, it seemed to work. In an early draft, Erasmus was also in it. Um, but it his presence kind of um, just distorted the the balance of it because he was such an authority figure in because he was older and and he was a teacher and all that so he didn't make the final draft but I hope I could work him into a play sometime because he had a really fun voice to work in it just didn't work in this play yeah it seems like a character study kind of at its core and you have these three kind of uh you call them friends at different points although they're very different uh people we have John Calvin we have Rabelais and then Ignatius so when you thought about these characters, they tell me a little bit about kind of the style that they speak in and what that says about them. The, you know, during the course of the play, for our listeners, they discover a murder. So that's kind of the plot we get um, <clears throat> through the arc of the play. But it really seems to be about the interplay of their their friendship and their back and forth about these various ideas. So tell me specifically about kind of how they speak and how that influences you know their ideas in the play. Sure. Yeah. So it's a verse play for listeners who don't know that already, which means it's written all in poetry. Um, And each of the characters speaks in their own form. So kind of in order of structure, you have John Calvin, who he speaks in what's called blank verse, which is it's metered, but there's no rhyme. Um, And then periodically, he actually slips into metered prose where he's not actually speaking in verse at all anymore. There's just regular prose speech, but with a strong meter behind it. Then Ignatius of Loyola, um, he speaks in what's called alliterative verse. And it's actually a, it's actually a um, very distinctively English form of verse. And obviously the character is Spanish and living in France. So I kind of went back and forth on, okay, can I get away with this? But I just went for it because I write in English. So that's what I did. Um, but it's a it's a form that's it's associated with um, with war, and it's a it's called a martial form. It, it's kind of what you see in Beowulf. Um, now I'm not using the the whole Anglo-Saxon form, which is a lot more complex than what I'm doing. But um, I do have the strong alliteration throughout Ignatius's work, and he is speaking in what's called um, tetrameter. So it has four pulses, four beats per line. Calvin has five beats per line. And then Rabelais, the third character, who's the one that people are generally least familiar with. Most people kind of go, oh, John Calvin, Ignatius of Loyola. And then who's this other guy? So Francois Rabelais, um, he speaks in metered and rhymed couplets. So his is the tightest form. It's five beats per line, and then each each line rhymes with the one after it, and it's it's very bouncy, and it leads to a lot of comedy because of the rhymes that he chooses. They're often kind of they're either body or just kind of silly, and yeah. So he's got he's got the most rigorous form that he's speaking in. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. He, he you really got at this kind of Falstaffian character that's. A lot of fun, and he has a great arc, I think, throughout the play as well. Um, one of the themes that we get at through, especially the interplay between um, Rabelais and Calvin, is this, the idea of the body and what is the importance of the body as in uh, B-O-D-Y. You also have a uh, commentary on B-A-W-D-Y, so we have both <laughs> types uh, in this play. But I want to read a bit um, kind of contrasting ideas uh, from the play quickly. So towards the beginning, um, Calvin has this uh, kind of commentary on grace and the body. He says, grace, yes, but grace to change, grace to turn this ruin of a man, a body thing to good. St. Paul bids us wear our skins like garments to be cast off at the end of the day. And when I fling mine off, I hope I'll find within not one thing I recognize. So he has kind of a... Um, skepticism towards the body um, or uh, a darker view of what that is versus Rabelais has this very 
uh, joyful view of the body and what it is and appreciation for what life is, even if it's not necessarily um, a fully Christian view of the body. He has some part of that. Um, so can you talk a little bit about kind of the exploration of this idea in the play? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think it's kind of death to an artist to try to try to make something that's culturally relevant. Um, you should make your art because you think it's beautiful. Um, and if it happens to have some relevance, that's great. But I do think that, I mean, that said, there is a bit of a crisis about what we're supposed to do with our bodies mm -hmm. today. Um, and you see, even among Christians, you see this um, push to transcend our bodies, um, whether through AI or uploading our consciousness or uh, augmenting our, our physical bodies with, with uh, complex surgeries or just these things that sort of leave us um, leave us questioning what what is the purpose of this thing that it mediates all of our experiences. We, we know nothing mm -hmm. that doesn't come to us through the body, through our five senses, but also our body is going to die. It's going to decay and break down. And that's a really, that that is the human experience in a nutshell. Um, we live in a house that's going to burn down. We just have that. And I think um, a lot of, oh, I don't know if that's always going to be the case. That that's an interesting question. Will will we ever reach the point where our bodies don't necessarily end, um, and where our bodies are made eternal, you know, on this plane and not waiting for the resurrection? But I think um, the crisis of the body it feels very urgent and contemporary, but it's been going on forever. I mean, we've always had this question of what are we supposed to do with this thing that we inhabit. So um at the at the Reformation, which is when this play takes place, I think a lot of the a lot of the the underlying tensions do actually have to do with the body. Um what role does our body play in worship? What role does our body play in sanctification? How about things like climbing the Spanish steps on your knees until your knees are shredded and bleeding? Well, the Protestants were saying, no, this isn't a good thing. And the Catholics were saying, we can atone for the world through our own physical suffering. And th those were really heated questions. So I wanted to get into um, the, not not necessarily the theology, because I'm not a theologian and I don't want to be making a theological argument, mm -hmm. but I wanted to bring the different perspectives on the body into, um, into conversation with each other, hopefully playful conversation. And and just sort of let readers hopefully see a perspective that they hadn't seen before on the body. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful um, distinction that you made between like making an argument versus kind of, uh, kind of an exploration of ideas or an unfolding of ideas. Sometimes people think of every art form needs to be like a formal logical argument for yeah. X opinion. That's how we think about art often. I, I think it couldn't be more wrong. I mean, a yeah. syllogism is going to be much more effective if you just want to make an argument or you know rhetoric. But I think you you're playing with different ideas in a way that I think we can see unfold and and think about in a helpful way. Well, and there's an interesting thing there with arguments and art. If I can just jump in, Carl Dennis is a contemporary poet and critic, and he he has this contention that every poem is making an argument. Um, but that the argument that it's making is not some kind of abstracted logical argument. Instead, it's making an argument about what is important in reality that we need to pay attention to. Um, it, so it's, it's, it's saying this is a thing that you need to look at. And that is an argument. Mm -hmm. It's making an argument about where our attention should go. And I like that idea um, because I think sometimes people think of art either as what you're saying, this sort of ideological, we've created an art piece that advances an agenda, or sometimes they think of it on the flip side as this is a purely personal expression. And that's not true. Neither of those are true. Instead, art is, um, it is making a claim. 
a, a claim about where you should be basically putting your love. Every, every piece of art is saying, this is what you should be doing with your love. But it's not doing that in sort of that abstracted treatise fashion or like saying like, this is the political conclusion you should reach or something like that. I don't know if that distinction makes sense, but I think it's an important distinction. Yeah, in some sense, every piece of art is saying, look at this thing, this thing is good, beautiful, worthy of your attention. And so that is kind of the underlying tacit argument that it's making about just the nature of the world. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's really, that's really good. Yeah, Dennis is great on this if you are interested in it. He's got a book called Poetry and Persuasion, and it's just really, really fascinating. Yeah, I'll definitely look that up. That's great. Poetry as Persuasion? I think it's Poetry as Persuasion. Sorry. Great. Yeah, af- back to this uh, question of kind of the crisis of the body, because I think you're you're right wow. that it's not a new crisis. This is just the human experience. What We, we, you know, we don't have bodies. We are bodies. This is how we experience the world. What we're seeing now, it seems, is kind of that same existential angst about what the body is. But now we have the technology to be actually be able to, to tinker with the body to a larger extent. So I think that kind of heightens or speeds up this, this sense of disembodiment, of removal from you know, where we are. Uh, yeah. And this the, the way you kind of bring us back to thinking about the body is kind of through... Uh, a certain type of humor, you know, body humor. Uh, Rabelais has just a great way of kind of uh, not quite shocking us, not not a full shock, but just kind of playing with us to get us to think more about uh, the body in a way that uh, I think is is helpful in in our current age. Tell me more about your your thoughts on his perspective on the body and and kind of where you fell there and and. Where, what made you think of him as the the interlocutor for those ideas? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably many listeners haven't read Rabelais, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not sure everyone should rush out and buy Rabelais and try to read him. He's a he's a he's a difficult cup of tea. Um, but he was famous for his just dirty writing. Um, there's not a page that you could read at the dinner table. It, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, he his most famous work is this massive combined novel called, called Gargantua and Pantagruel. And it it's a thousand pages long and it is just wildly obscene. Um, and, and there's a lot of different theories about what he's doing with that. Um, it's basically to give there is, I mean, to give a rough plot structure. It's the adventures of these this the two generations of giants who are moving through the world and um they're being educated in the classical liberal tradition in Paris. And then they have all these little um they ha- they go to war and um they get married and and they, so they just kind of have it's just the story of their lives. But told in these i mean there there's one section where it's five pages of it's a five page list of book titles from one of the libraries and they're all dirty puns on existing medieval texts so they're okay. just these it's and it's hysterical but it's also you get you know two and a half pages in and you're like oh my gosh i have to do this for another two and a half pages <laughs> so um he's he's just this Rabelais was just this incredibly over the top, quirky guy, and everybody was kind of out to get him. Both sides during the Reformation, mm-hmm. the Protestants didn't; they they were mad at him because he wouldn't leave the Catholic Church. The Catholics were always banning his books, and he kept losing patrons. And then he'd have to run around and find a new patron, or he would end up in big trouble. That kind of thing. So he's he um. And like I said, there's all kinds of disagreements on what is his project? What is he doing? Um, And I think that makes him kind of the perfect character to adjudicate the discussion between Calvin and Ignatius, um, because Rabelais is so deeply implicated here. Hmm. He's he's not, he's guilt, he's considered guilty by both sides. So he kind of gets to just stand there and say, okay, you guys already hate me. Um, so let's talk. You can't, you can't insult me any more than you already have. Um, 
And obviously throughout the play, he's shown to be, he probably deserves some of this. Like he's definitely not a pure character, but he's also not necessarily guilty of the things that everyone thinks he's guilty of, which is interesting. So he's just a really wild character. And I think if there, if we could, I don't know that there is a Rebelazian voice right now, um, but maybe there is. And we just haven't, we haven't recognized it for what it is. But I think that a Rabelais who could really write about the body today and what it means to have a body today would be quite a quite an interesting. I know there's a couple of candidates out there, but I don't know if any of them have quite nailed it yet. But it would be a lovely thing, and I would be excited to see that person. Yeah, you said earlier that this isn't a theological exploration, but you touch on theological themes. Let's maybe say say it, it that is way. Theological, um, yeah. So I want to read another quote, and this is um, three friends are sitting down for for drinks, and Rabelais has this kind of uh, toast that he gives, um, where he, he's I think he's kind of uh, I read it as kind of mocking the other two, kind of serious. As it's a line here. Um, but he says, come sit, drink, and then we'll dine. To what shall we drink? To women, wine, and song. We'll not go down easy in this throng. I think, and to the church, is no more the simple joy it was. To merest orthodoxy, the perseverance of the saints, the hope that grace may one day deign to paint our souls like theirs. Or shall we simply toast that gratuity of God, that most lurid, bloody, gross, exquisite, body thing, the resurrection of the body. So tell us, why is the resurrection of the body um, body in the sense that Rabelais is, is using it? I mean, I think once you really sit, it, it seems, so when you when you first hear about it as a child, you and, and all the paintings and stuff, you get this idea of like, oh, well, I'll just kind of float up to heaven and we'll be wearing white and it'll be great. But then when you really start to think about it or um, you spend some time in a graveyard, I have these little kids and we, they, they are strange. We like to go to graveyards. Um, that's just something we like to do together. And my son, a couple of months ago when we were hanging out in a graveyard, he, he was standing next to a grave and he looked at me and he said, mama, is there a body down there? I'm like, yeah, there's somebody buried there. And he said, so it's probably just bones by now, right? And I said, yeah, it's probably just bones because it was from like 1870 or something. Um, and he said, that's really sad. And then he started talking about the resurrection of the body. And he was wondering, well, when the body, when the resurrection of the body comes, is it going to be just the bones that come up or mm -hmm. all these things? And um, I think that that kind of childlike, like, oh, what is the process here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is weird. Or, I mean, you think about our our bodies are generally pretty worn out when we die. Um, they're, we're kind of gaunt, we're hunched over. And are we going to roll back through those processes? And these are the bodies that maybe we struggled with gluttony and we were overweight. Is that something where that's going to show up? And I know people say like, oh, our resurrected bodies will be perfect. But what is that going to mean? Because um, these are the bodies that we worked for salvation. You know, we worked towards sanctity through these bodies. Um, I don't think, I don't think they'll they'll just be automatically perfect. I don't like. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what what mm -hmm. it's going to be. But it's a mystery, and it doesn't. Um. I, I don't find it imaginatively satisfying that our bodies are just going to be perfect. No freckles, no moles, no nothing. I mean, that that doesn't make sense with the way God works. God tends to carry faults through and make them holy instead of just eliminating them, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, or, or another way to say it would be we know we're going to be made perfect, but what is perfection in that yeah. in that setting? So, you know, what part of how we look now is going to, there's going to be some sort of um, continuity to, to be ourselves, to be the same person. Yeah. 
but what what parts? What does that look like? You know, we know that um, Jesus' resurrected body had the marks of the crucifixion, and that yeah. was um, a type of perfection, not the way we usually think about perfection. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we're not all going to look like airbrushed Instagram models. That's not very boring what world. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's it's worth spending some time thinking about the resurrection of the body that way and thinking about um, what of my body shows my salvation um, because that's probably going to make it to heaven, you know, like stretch marks on a woman who's born children, like that's part of her salvation. And I don't think God's going to just kind of get get rid of those. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Those distinctive qualities. Yeah. Like if you think about like an, I think of an older married couple who kind of teases each other about their quirks. They're not really teasing each other about their flaws. They, in some sense, aren't flaws anymore in yeah. some part of that process. I don't know how that works. Um, hopefully, I'll get there someday. But, you know, that's <laughs> that's really interesting how that, that works. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at there. Well, maybe. I don't really remember what my thought process was in writing that speech, but that's what I think about it now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I, I want to, uh, I don't know if this is pushing back against one part or just uh, getting more of your thoughts on it, but... One theme throughout, uh, thinking about John Calvin, um, he seems to have a, a large amount of despair about kind of fate or we could say predestination is what he's he's thinking about. Some of the reformers thought of this idea of um, kind of uh, all, all powerful, God deciding everything for us as in incredibly comforting, as, you know, kind of this, this assurance of salvation. But in, in this kind of fictional world, uh, Calvin is has much more of an edge to how he thinks about fate. What was kind of a part of that decision uh, to, to explore his character in that way? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, the rendering of Calvin was actually the most difficult because he is such a archetypal figure in a lot of people's imaginations. Mm -hmm. There's no Calvinism. And I wanted to make him a character. So um, he's he's actually the one who's most based on his biography, his sort of psychological biography, and where he was at at this point in his life. He's quite young. He's the youngest okay. of the three. Um, and he was really, really struggling with super deep depression. Um in in the play, I have him as an alcoholic. There isn't, you know, a ton of evidence that he was actually an alcoholic, but he did love to drink. We do know that. Um, and I, I I wanted to draw out that this was a major part of Calvin's story was this this period of despair that he experienced in this while he was in school. And some of it was, I mean, biographically, he he kind of was pulled around a little bit and told, you know, this is going to be your career and then this is going to be your career. So he was getting moved around by his family a lot from sort of calling to calling. And um, I think that was, that that probably shows up in some mm -hmm. of his ideas about fate at this point where he feels like he doesn't have a lot of control over his destiny and he's being pushed and pulled and it doesn't matter what he does because he can do as well as he can in a certain setting, but he could get yanked out of that setting and plot someplace else with no warning. So I wanted with him, um, because I knew that, you know, some people just really, really adore Calvin and some people really can't stand him. And I wanted to ground his character as much as possible in who Calvin really was at this point and then let people kind of deal with that however they wanted to. And it's been interesting to see folks who are who are sort of anti-Calvinist, they tend to think I'm I'm being too charitable to him. Oh, interesting. And folks who are super Calvinist tend to think like why are you just bringing out this dark side of his life and not not giving us a, a more rounded picture and it's really just because I th where the play is set, I picked a snapshot and this is from my research, where he kind of was, and obviously, you know, it's it's fiction, it's it's dramatically enhanced, but this is where he was in his life, from what I can tell. So that's kind of why he's done the way he's done. Yeah, I guess one thing I'm getting from what you're saying is, um, 
that if we think about kind of the younger version of himself, there's maybe a, a larger amount of angst and openness to these types of debates. Um, yes. That definitely is a, a helpful way to see the play. If you think about college students debating, there's a yeah. different way that they would dis- discuss this versus the established author who's writing the kind of treatise that's all laid out and things are decided. There's not really a lot yeah. that's in flux. But all, all the characters do have some kind of flux to them. Um, over the the course of this play, which I think is helpful when you get at the the dialectic of the back and forth and their their conversation. So, um, yeah, they're all still trying to. I wanted to catch them before they were these famous figures, and let and kind of give a peek at the development of the ideas that they would become known for. Like this is the idea in its baby form. Yes, I like that. <laughs> As a kind of. Uh, a meta point in here, you have a really interesting um, point that Rabelais make. Uh, he makes it, I think, maybe two different points in the in the play. But this idea that um, when you have two people in a dialogue, there's kind of some uh, proportionality to their back and forth. You can have the, the question and the response, and it seems like everyone's on fair ground. Versus when you have three. Uh, it always seems like there's one person who has the last word. Uh, I, I thought that was a, a really interesting point just on the structure of the play within the play. Can you t- tell me a little bit about where that idea came from? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these ideas, I mean, and you I mean, you probably heard this from other writers before. They don't really, you just start writing along and then <laughs> one of your characters starts talking, especially with Rabelais, this guy... He just talks and talks, and I never, I, I don't sit down and like plan what he's going to say. He just tar- starts talking, and that's what you have. And he has but, long speeches, so you can kind of see that in here, too. <laughs> yeah, he just goes on and on. I'm writing another play with him. That it, This is actually the first of a trilogy of Rabelais plays. And this second play, I just, he's just out of control. And I, I don't, I don't know. He's just. He's running amok at this point. You, but, need, you um, need to add John Calvin back in there to keep him in, whip him into shape. I think he, he, the that's problem. the balance here, I think. Yes, because his interlocutor in this next play is Death, um, the, like Death the figure. And Death just doesn't say a lot. So Rabelais just like runs on and on and on. And I have to figure out a better balance for them because they just... It's not balanced right now. But, but to your thing about the three-way conversation... Um, I think Rabelais just was really getting frustrated with the way that these um, two are trying to go back and forth and back and forth and expecting to find some kind of, that one of them is going to triumph. I think that he's frustrated by that. And he says, well, this is ridiculous. And I I think he, um, in some way, he's kind of lauding the three-way conversation in a sideways thing here because he's saying in a three-way conversation you don't have the opportunity for someone to just beat someone else down because you always have that third voice that can come in and disrupt everything and obviously the the three-way conversation is a staple of Mm -hmm. philosophy um and then you have the thesis the antithesis the synthesis you also have the um the running conversation between the, the the three parts of the trinity it really is a huge it's a, it's a huge theme in Western thought, just in how you how you reach truth is that there's kind of always three. Um, and so put making Rabelais sort of, I don't know if he's being ironic, but I think he might be being ironic and actually praising the three-way conversation here in term I, I, as opposed to the two-way. Um, this is a passage people always love. They always want to come back to and read this passage and talk about it. And I honestly just wrote it. I mean, I think I wrote it at like two in the morning one day and it's people's favorite section. (laughs) It's funny. (laughs) That's great. No, I think that's the kind of Trinitarian dialogue is, is helpful for these types of conversations. So I I appreciated that. I want to turn a little bit to kind of the time of year we're in, because this is a good time of year to be talking about this play as we're in Lent currently. Um, for listeners, the the play happens kind of on the cusp between Carnival and Lent. So we have this uh, kind of, uh, you, you call it, Jaina, a bridge between two times. And, you know, we're currently in the season of Lent. So 
how does this specific time in the church calendar kind of frame their conversation? Yeah, so the play starts um, right after Vespers on Sh- on Shrove Tuesday, on Fat Tuesday, and then they basically have all night until Ash Wednesday starts. So it's like the last bit of Carnival. Um, and I I think some something we don't really have a sense of Carnival. We don't mm-hmm. we've lost that. We don't have the sense of what Carnival was and some of that I think has to do with our abstraction from the body um but carnival was a lot more than just oh we're gonna go have a crazy party um it was that for sure but it was it was almost more of a um we're going to acknowledge the physicality of our salvation and of our damnation um so we're going to acknowledge that the the spiritual things that are that the church is telling us are happening are also happening through our bodies um so you would i mean you'd have you'd have plays and you, you i mean tons of plays drama drama and carnival go together really well um traditionally they people would always be putting on plays during carnival um you'd have costumes and you'd have these parades you'd have people staying up all night and some of the traditions from Carnival would they really shock us. Um, so for example, there was a there was kind of a carnival joke where um someone would they would they would take all the passages from the Bible that have to do with defecation or sex, string them together and stand in the in the public square and just read all the like like kind of obscene passages from the Bible in in a line. That's all that they would do. And people would just gather and laugh. They would think it was so funny. Or you'd have these like mock sermons where people would get together and do like a really grotesque, obscene parody of the Sermon on the Mount and would like preach a sermon based on it in the public square as just completely a joke with like tons of Latin puns and all this stuff. And you see um, this this kind of um, almost giving like a gravitational pull to spiritual realities and like saying like, no, these things do sink into the world in a way Um, and, and, and a resisting of the Gnostic tendency to just abstract things. Now, obviously lots of bad things happen in carnival too. So we don't have to, you know, go back and say everyone should get drunk all the time. But there's something about Carnival that um, it, the con- we don't have the contrast anymore. Um, mm-hmm. So we kind of go, you know, we 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 all just. I mean, people used to not work for a lot of Carnival because it's the middle of winter. So you could have you could have periods of several weeks where everyone was off work, just wandering around partying in the cities, and you transition from that to, okay, it's Lent. The Lenten penances were much stricter, partly in, because they simply didn't have food anymore at that point in the winter. So there just wasn't much to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that contrast, it's kind of like a cold, a cold bath or a cold shower um, of sal- damnation comes through the body and salvation comes through through the body and your spirit is in many ways following your body. Obviously your body follows your spirit. You learn spiritual strengths. It teaches your body, but you can't have a lazy body and a strong spirit. You know, Mm -hmm. your, your spirit imitates your body in a lot of ways. And we don't think that way anymore, but the medievals knew that. Um, So that's kind of what I'm trying to show here is that just give us a little taste of that, that really marked contrast that Christendom had, and we just don't have anymore. Yeah, you use the term uh, that the cold plunge or the cold shower, hot and cold yeah. shower. That, of course, is a French uh, drama principles that's yeah. great here in this yeah, context. Yeah. <laughs> but also, yes, yeah, so the this the the moral contrast is something that it, it doesn't seem like we have. It's not like oh, now people who are more secular have this kind of carnival 
atmosphere. It just seems like it's no one has it. It's just kind of yeah. lost uh, to everyone. There's um, work all the time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's there's yeah. work and there's um, some people who are trying to maintain a constant kind of pleasure high. You have that yes. that as a principle, which of course is extremely deadening uh, over time. And then uh, yeah, other people who are kind of have a, a more stoic. Uh, way of of kind of viewing the world. So this is a helpful, I think, contrast to us as we think about Lent um, and how it has to do with the body. Um, yeah. So and this wasn't the only carnival period either. There's there's other carnival periods that we've completely lost. Like we have a little bit of this one, but there was a big carnival period in the summer around the summer solstice and the feast of Saint John the Baptist, and then there was a significant carnival period um, in the in the fall, uh, around Michaelmas, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it was very much, much more of a, throughout the year, you'd have this rising and falling instead of boom, everything on fat Tuesday. And, and mm-hmm. even the carnival season that we think of as fat Tuesday, it stretched from epiphany to Shrove Tuesday. So you had weeks and weeks of carnival instead of this all c- compressed into after work on fat Tuesday. <laughs> And it's just a very different way to live. Absolutely. Good. Well, is there any other um, kind of passage of the play that you want to leave us with or other um, any other thoughts? It's a good question. Um, I I always I like I really like the last speech, um, which I it, it yeah, I, I just I'll read a little bit of it. Um, yeah, please do. So Rabelais left. He's left on stage by himself. The other two have exited with their own speeches, um, and he is left alone, which he obviously has thoughts on being left alone, but we'll skip those for now. Um, He says, so what's my scene? A woman dead, a score of night watchmen dismayed, one friend outraged, another friend embroiled, and I, Rabelais, jesting as all sparks fly. Ignatius speaks of battle pitched, and Jean, he hopes I'm killed in it. But I jest on, for jesting's still a noble art, at least as noble as war or reading creased books in dusty halls of learning. Love wisdom, say I, but not with what's above. She's a pretty girl and ripe. Love her with your body, your skin and bones, the gurgle of your gut. Love her with your rutting heart. And I, I was, I like those lines. Again, I when I read them, I think like, oh, I don't feel like I wrote those. I feel like someone else did. But I like those lines um, because I, I think intuitively we think of wisdom as abstracted. And that's not the way, that's not the way it's written about in the Bible. That's not the way it's written about in Christendom. Um, wisdom and salvation are things that are, they're, they're imminent. They're um, incarnated. And I, I would love to I don't know. I'm still learning what that means, but I would love to see more and more people talking about that element of salvation. Wonderful. Good. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, but Thanks. thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Yeah, this was so fun. Thanks a ton. And for our listeners, the play is Sonele Matina out from Wise Blood Books, and we'll put the link in the show notes. So thanks for joining us today. Fantastic. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.